Amen. Hi, Ruth. I'm glad you're here this evening. So now we're on to Luke chapter 18, which begins with two unique Lucan parables. That is, they are parables that uh, were taught by Jesus that only Luke tells us about. And once again, he returns to several very important themes that we find in the Gospel of Luke and in the second book that Luke wrote, the book of Acts. The first one, which we've talked about many times, is the importance of prayer, the necessity of prayer. And it isn't just the power of prayer. It's the power of the one to whom we pray. That was the point uh, that Jesus was making back in chapter 17, verse 6, when he said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. When we come to the God we meet in Jesus Christ um, in prayer, in Jesus' name, and I'll talk a little bit about that phrase in just a moment, we are reposing whatever weak faith we may perceive ourselves to have. We are reposing our trust and we are turning in desperation to the big God who can move mountains. And I would say, Linda, I'm sure you would say, and others from the congregation who have been praying for Brian, we have seen God moving mountains for Brian. We have seen uh, a miracle happening with Brian, that God has been delivering him as, as people in desperation and in whatever faint faith we may have turn to, to God and place uh, Brian in God's hands. Now, what does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Well, first of all, you know, Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In John 10, verse 30, he says, I and the Father are one. The point is that, number one, when we look to Jesus, especially when we look to Jesus on the cross, we see the very heart and character of God. God is omnipotent. God is eternal. But God is not arrogant. And God uh, has made himself available to us and, um, and has made, uh, made himself a servant to our needs because of his great love for us and his charity toward us. And so <clears throat> to pray, uh, to know Jesus is to know God, first of all. And to believe in Jesus is to have God's salvation. To pray in Jesus' name, then, is to say, look, I know that Jesus is the only way to God the Father. I have no merit in and of myself to approach uh, God's throne with petitions of prayer. But Jesus has shown me, number one, it's possible that God wants to hear from me, that God wants to work in my life and in the lives of those for whom we pray and that he's a compassionate God, that he's a listening God, he's a patient God. He is all of these things. And so Jesus, once, of course, he died on the cross and the curtain in the temple was torn. He made it possible for all of us to have access to the Father in Jesus' name. So that's the first thing um, that it means to pray in Jesus' name. But to Pray in Jesus' name also means this, to pray in ways that are consistent with the will and the known character of God. We know God's will that we love one another as we've been loved. We know that he loves us and that it's his desire to save us. And he's playing a long game. We may get delivered uh, along the way in this life. But the real question is, will we be delivered for eternity? We know that through Jesus Christ, that eternal deliverance from sin and death and darkness has been given to us as a free gift for all who trust in Jesus. So uh, to, to, uh, to approach God in prayer in Jesus' name also means 
to pray in a way that is consistent with this gracious, loving, long-term will of God. It's also to pray in a way that is consistent with the character of God. It's also to know that as a child of God through Jesus, I can talk with God about anything. I can even expose to God the worst of my nature or the worst of my impulses. And he'll understand because God will say, look, I know he or she doesn't get it completely, but they are turning to me. And so he takes our prayer, however imperfect it may be, huh? and uh, he, he turns it into something that is consonant with his will. We seek God's will to be done. What does Jesus say? He tells us to pray, thy will be done. And in Romans 8, we, we hear how all of this goes um, in terms of prayer, um, where uh, Paul writes, Romans 8, beginning at verse 26, he says, The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So our prayer may be imperfect, but as we come to God in Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit takes that prayer and molds it and shapes, uh, shapes it in a way that is consistent with the will of God, even if we don't fully understand that at the time. Now, this topic is important because uh, in the Psalms, you find a whole category of Psalms called imprecatory psalms. And I've included in the comments tonight uh, an article from uh, from Wikipedia on the uh, imprecatory psalms and also a video that was done several years ago by Fuller Seminary of uh, Bono, the lead singer of U2, who is a Christian, of course, and Eugene Peterson, the Presbyterian pastor and scholar and philosopher and poet who produced the message translation of the Bible. They became good friends after uh, Peterson learned that Bono was reading the message and enjoyed it. Um, and, but they got together for a conversation on the Psalms and they have a really good a uh, few minutes when they talk about the imprecatory psalms. In a nutshell, the imprecatory psalms are ones in which people of God pray to God in frustration over injustices um, uh, perpetrated against them and say, God, punch punch that person's nose, basically, as, as Peterson translates one of the psalms. Well, um, does God really want us to have that attitude? No, but when we bring that attitude into the presence of God, the Holy Spirit will even take those kinds of prayers huh, and turn them uh, into um, prayer requests that are pleasing to God. And here's the other piece of it that will happen then. Uh, on the other side of it, the, the Holy Spirit will work within us to gradually understand and, and uh, pray in a way that is complicit with the will of God. You've heard me say this before. If we give God an inch, he will take a mile. If we come into God's presence in Jesus' name, trusting that the Father hears us because of Jesus, and trusting that because of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will take our prayers and turn them into something that will honor God and fulfill his will in the life of the world, even though that's not exactly what we have in mind in the first place because we're imperfect and messy and sometimes vengeful, vengeful, right? God will turn that into something good. Um, the point is that God will work to hone our discipleship. He will whittle away our ego and our self-centeredness 
but he will also encourage us to always come into his presence, to be honest with God. And um, the reason I included material on the imprecatory Psalms is because in essence, uh, in our first parable, what's happening is a woman is asking for a judgment against her adversary. And we'll talk about the significance of that in just a few moments. Hi, Pastor Chuck. So I wanted to set the table for that. So in these first two parables, we're going to learn two things about prayer. First of all, we must be persistent and determined in our praying to not give up in our praying. It is almost always too soon to give up on our prayers. Now, God may shape and reform our prayers because of that interaction with him, because prayer is a two-way conversation. Even when we don't perceive it, it is. Uh, but we're to be persistent. So, for example, Linda, over these past five months, some of our specific prayers for Brian may have changed uh, over time. But that's because of how God is is working in our prayers and in us and in our hearts and minds and wills in this prayer conversation that's going on. So the first thing that Jesus teaches us tonight is to be persistent in our praying. The second thing he teaches us is humility. Now, I would say once again, and I know I bring this up a lot, but <clears throat> the best book I've ever read on prayer is Ole Housby's, just called Prayer. Still in print after, golly, I think that book was published in the early 50s. It's still in print. It is, I think, worthy of being called a classic. Ole Housby, um, Norwegian pastor, uh, and the book is called Prayer. And, you know, he talks about the two things that make a prayer a prayer. First, desperation. Well, you are desperate in your praying when you keep praying it, when you know you have nowhere else to turn. Persistence, determination, desperation, helplessness. And the second is faith. So we can come to this God we meet in Jesus with persistent prayer, determined prayer, first of all, and with humble prayer, a humble trust, a humble faith, a recognition that God is our Father and He cares about us. All right, so let's dig into these uh, unique parables. 18 verses 1 to 8, first of all. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because of this widow, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them just give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now there is so much to this parable. Uh, there are just so much. First of all, this parable is a twin to another parable in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus tells. Uh, take a look at it real quickly. Luke eleven. 5 to 8. Luke 11, 5 to 8. 
here Jesus tells the parable about the man who has a friend who comes to him at midnight because he's had visitors show up and he doesn't have anything to feed them. And at first the man inside <clears throat> won't uh, respond to his friend outside knocking at the door. He says, you know, the kids are asleep. I'm, the door is locked. It's, I'm, I'm done for the night. But he says, Jesus, in the, this parable, because the guy keeps bothering him, in my translation it says because of his impudence, by the way, though, it's the same word uh, used in, in the parable in Luke 18, 5, bothering me. It's just this kind of persistent nagging. Um, this friend will get up and take care of the request of his friend. And in both parables... The upshot is, look, if this unrighteous, sinful man is willing to provide food for his friend when he knocks at the door because of his importunity, how much more will God respond to you when you pray to him? In this parable, it is, if an unjust judge, and by the way, the, the uh, word there uh, for unjust is related to the word justify, and to righteousness. This is an unrighteous judge. He's a corrupt judge. If this corrupt judge, because of the persistence of this widow, will render justice, again, the word is related to the word for justify, uh, righteous or just is how we could translate it. Um, if he's willing to render appropriate justice to this widow, how much more will God, who loves you, be willing to hear your persistent prayers and do it quickly. Uh, now, here's the deal. There are some people who look at these parables and they say, oh, that means God is reluctant to give, give me what I need, so I have to keep pushing. No, that's not the point. Jesus do, uses the, the um, Semitic argument form that we've talked up, about before. If this little thing... How much more this bigger thing? In other words, if a puny, corrupt judge <coughs> or a, a puny, uh, stingy, selfish friend are willing to do the right thing, how much more will God, who is righteous, who is holy, who is perfect in his goodness, how much more will he be willing to respond to you? Why is persistence in prayer necessary? Because of that process that I was talking about earlier and that Paul talks about in Romans 8. God hones our prayers, right? And he uh, tests our faith, not in the sense of, I want to see if you pass this test. No, in the sense of him honing your faith so that when the answer to prayer comes, there can be no doubt that it came from God. When I um, uh, think again about Brian's situation or um, uh, Terry and Deb, when I think about what happened with Lauren all those years ago when the barrel exploded and crashed against his skull and, and uh, you know, it looked like he was not going to survive. When over... A period of time we saw all of these people from all of these congregations from all over the place praying and somehow Brian has made it to this point somehow Lauren got to the point where he was able to lead and has been able to lead a normal life how can that be considered anything but an answer to prayer so sometimes God hones um, our faith, but he also um, hones our praying along the way so that it is pleasing to him. Now, let me give you another example of something like that that I mentioned before. Um, we knew a woman years and years ago. She had um, three girls and a son. The oldest child was um, about two years old, maybe three years old. And then she had uh, another 
uh, child who was two years younger. And those are the two that, that figure in the story. So the oldest child died uh, at the age of three. It was a horrible um, thing. I think it was cancer. Um, so what happened after that was this mom poured all of her attention and her energy and uh, into her daughter to the point where it affected her other relationships. And um, then this daughter, this second daughter, had a, a pool accident, uh, somehow got away from the family and was found at the bottom of the pool and had been down there for several minutes. And the mom was by herself in a room at the hospital while this second daughter was uh, being attended to by the people in the emergency room. And you can just imagine, I mean, she was, she, she was horrified for her daughter, but she was also horrified for the fact that this was seeming to happen again. And she was just screaming at God. And God can withstand that, by the way. He's big enough to withstand that kind of thing. Uh, he's not a wimpy God. So he was. she was just screaming at God uh, for her child. And she said it, there was a silence then. And in the silence, she heard in her her mind, her heart. You shall have no other gods before me. And she said, I realized at that point that I had made my daughter an idol in compensation for the loss of this one child in not wanting to lose another child, in, you know, somehow in her own mind trying to compensate for whatever deficiencies she may have perceived in herself as a parent um, previously. She, this child had become her god. She did everything for this child. And she said, I just told God I put her in your hands. So you see what happened was as she called out to the God she knew in Jesus, the Holy Spirit honed that prayer and honed her faith. This is how God works in prayer and sometimes that honing process takes a long time. Yeah, that's exactly right, Ken. At the end of Job, you know, he has these three friends who were worthless as friends, and because of their own fear of being afflicted with things similar to what Job had, they had to try to explain everything as though Job were to blame for all of his faults. And Job repels that those arguments rightly, but he also is angry with God. And so he yelling at God. And then God finally says, as you say, Ken, where were you when I created the world? There's a point at which in our praying, we must acknowledge God as God. And this is that uh, helplessness that Halsby talks about. There's no prayer without a recognition that I am helpless without God's help. I cannot do this. You know, as some of you have heard me say before, I don't go to God in, in prayer and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do, endorse it. In true prayer, we recognize our utter helplessness and our need of God to help. That's part of that honing that happens then. So that's why persistence in prayer is needed. Now let's unpack this parable a little bit. I'm probably only going to get through this parable tonight, but it's great stuff. Uh, it, this is unique. At the very beginning, Jesus tells them what the parable is going to be about. Um, to pray always and to not lose heart. And then um, 
it, it's interesting. Um, there are some scholars who think that maybe when we come to verse 2, Jesus actually has in mind a particular judge uh, that people knew that they could identify with for this fictional parable that he tells. So he says, in a certain city, and literally in the, in the original Greek, it says, in a certain city, there was a certain judge. <laughs> uh, but then it says, he neither feared God nor respected man. Take a look at Second Chronicles uh, 19, verse 7. Second Chronicles 19, 7. I know Second Chronicles is one of your favorite books <laughs> in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 9, 7. sure I've got them. I'm sorry, it's 19.7. I apologize. Second Chronicles 19.7. 19.7. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. These are the instructions of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, to um, uh, judges. He's saying, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Now, the fear of the Lord is a common phrase. I wrote these notes down for myself. The fear of the Lord is a common phrase um, in the Gospel of Luke. It's a really important idea to Luke. For Luke... The fear of God or the fear of the Lord is both reverence for God and a healthy fear of God's retribution for unrighteousness or for unrepentant sin. So um, I remember my mentor and uh, New Testament professor, Pastor Shine, Bruce Shine, used to say, look, the fear of God is awe and reverence and respect for God. It is that, but it's also a recognition that he could take you out like that. <laughs> and this is very important <clears throat> because it, it, it means that uh, fear of God also includes an understanding that he is a righteous God. And that when we unrepentantly flout his will, if we're afraid of God, we should, first of all, not engage in that behavior. But if there's any fear of God in us, we should learn to repent and trust in God and not in ourselves or in our unrighteous actions. Luke's understanding of the fear of God goes Back to that famous passage in Proverbs, Proverbs 1, verse 7. Take a look at that. Proverbs 1, 7. Right after the Psalms. You know this one. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And by that, it means fools despise hearing the word of God. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of true knowledge. So uh, Luke has that kind of an idea. Whenever the phrase, the fear of the Lord or the fear of God come up in the gospel of Luke, and that you know that even when it's Jesus who says it, you understand that this is what Luke is getting at. So here you have this judge who did not fear God, which Jehoshaphat said the judges of Israel needed to, uh, to do. They needed to fear God, otherwise they would render unrighteous judgments. And it says, nor respected man. And um, the word uh, there in the original Greek that's translated as respect, it has the idea of, of, of um, um, paying attention to um, um, or um, 
not treating them contemptuously, uh, your fellow human beings. So you see, not only does this violate the understanding of judges, it also violates the basic understanding that we have in the two tables of the Ten Commandments, to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, so we are introduced to this judge, and he's just corrupt and no good. Now, get in verse 3, we're introduced to the second character in this parable, and that's the widow. Widows were, ex um, excuse me, judges were expected to treat widows with respect. Jewish society was expected to treat widows, orphans, slaves, foreigners, uh, immigrants with respect and love. Uh, take a look at Deuteronomy 24, verses 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 24, 17 and 18. Remember, Deuteronomy is Moses' last words to the people of Israel before they enter into the promised land and before he dies. So he's giving them a kind of final charge and a final reminder of God's will or God's law for them. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 17 and 18. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment in pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. So notice the, the flow of the argument here that God is making through Moses. You are to treat the despised the marginalized, the powerless, the neglected, the orphan, the widow, widow, the sojourner, the immigrant who is passing through your territory. You are to treat them with utmost respect and you are to give them uh, the highest justice. Why? Because I once redeemed you out of slavery in Egypt. You see what, what's going on there is once again the great reversal as we see throughout the Gospel of Luke. It, only in Deuteronomy, what it is, it, 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 uh, God is saying through Moses is this. You were slaves and nobodies under the thumb of the most powerful empire of the day, and I brought you out of slavery. You didn't do this yourselves. I did it for you. How did the Ten Commandments start out with the introduction in Exodus 20? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Huh? Before God gets to uh, giving the people of Israel any commands, he reminds them of who they are by his grace. He is their people, not because they deserve it, not because they perform uh, uh, appropriately according to the commandments, but because he is their God, because he's charitable to them. That's the reason. And so the idea here in the Deuteronomy passage is you were on the bottom rung and now I've delivered you into the land. And when you come to a point, when you're in the promised land, when there are people who are considered by the rest of the world to be on the bottom rung, you're not to treat them in any way different from everybody else. You are to lift them up and give them righteous judgments, including the widows. Now, throughout the Gospel of Luke, we see uh, widows um, playing a prominent role either in the, uh, in, in the narration of the, of the gospel story itself, in other words, in the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, or in parables that Jesus tells. Uh, so, for example, in Luke 2.37, you have Anna, who was a widow. In Luke Take a look at Luke 4, 25 and 26. Um, here, uh, this is where Jesus um, is in Nazareth. And this is part of what he said that caused uh, the people of Nazareth to reject him because he was talking about a foreign widow from Old Testament times 
He says, in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. So the point is, here was uh, this woman who was uh, doubly cursed according to um, kind of the prevailing Jewish mindset. She was a widow and uh, she was a foreigner. So Jesus elevates widows all the time. Uh, there are other passages I could point to, but I'm not going to go into all of that at this point. So what Jesus is doing is telling a parable that is about the reversal of fortunes. Remember this. Widows had no property rights or very limited property rights in that time. They did not inherit their husband's estate when their husbands died. Their, their husband's estate went to the brothers of the man. So this is why so many widows, uh, according to the Bible and also according to other historical records, became prostitutes or busybodies or were dependent on their uh, sons or their families. I mean, you take a look at uh, the Old Testament book of Ruth. There you have uh, the widow uh, uh, Naomi and the widow Ruth, as well as the widow Orpah. But you have those two widowed women. And what do they do? Well, they try to go to their families for help. That's their only recourse. So that's what they do. So um, widows were powerless. So here we have the two characters. We have this powerless widow. Um, the subject of injustice, despite the fact that God's word said that widows were sh to be shown justice. And you have an unjust judge who does not like justice. He likes bribes. He likes status. So that's the stage that Jesus sets. And his original hearers to this of this parable would have said, oh yeah, I am, I know about a widow like that. I know a judge like that. All right. All right, I'm just looking at my notes and making sure I'm not missing anything. So she kept coming to him and she said, this is in verse three, give me justice against my adversary. The word that is used there for ad, that's translated as adversary is ante dike which is also the word used for Satan. So uh, someone has treated her with great evil and she's asking for vindication. The word she says, she says she wants justice. She wants to be vindicated. She wants to be treated rightly. Um, we don't know the particular nature of this, but apparently this widow has been um, subjected to um, uh, horrible behavior by this adversary, whatever it might be. And uh, it's interesting in the original Greek, um, it says for a while he refused. The, the word is, um, oh, I think it's pantota. Tota is time. No, the, here it's just uh, chronos. Uh, it just says for time, and when it's like that in the Greek, the Greek, then the in, uh, yeah, the indefinite article a or an is presumed rather than the definite article the the. Uh, so for a time, uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't pay any attention to her. But finally, we see in verse three. <laughs> He has one of these internal monologues in many, many of the parables that we find in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus talks about the internal monologues of um, of characters in the parable. For example, the prodigal son says, how many of my father's servants have enough to eat and more? Yet I'm here with these pigs. Um so here you have the, the judges, this unjust judge's internal monologue. He acknowledges that he doesn't fear God or respect uh, human beings. 
yet because this widow keeps bothering me. Again, that's the same verb used um, for the importuning friend in the parable in Luke 11, 5 to 8. Is it, uh, my friend is nagging me. She is nagging me, so I will give her justice. Um, and then it says, he gives the reason why. The first reason is, um, so she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Now, this is an interesting word here that is translated as beat me down. If you um, look in the interlinear and you scroll down there to verse 5 in chapter 18. Let's see. Uh, this is this is kind of fun. Yet because um, the causes she causes trouble to me, this widow. I will avenge or I will give justice to or I will vindicate her uh, so that she will not. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, so that the end will not um, exhaust me through her coming. Now, exhaust, the word there is um, uh, hupo uh, piazze. Well, it, this is actually a technical term from boxing. <laughs> and if you click on it, you'll see that it means to strike under the eye. <coughs> In other words, uh, from boxing, it comes from someone who is able to either get above or get below the, 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 the fists of the one boxer and get them under the eye. Huh? Boom. And that's exactly uh, what this guy is saying. This, this woman is going to knock me out through her continued uh, importunity, her constant petitioning for justice. She is going to, it's not just wearing me down, she's going to knock me out. She's going to, uh, I, I, I'm going to be out for the count. I, I, I'm going to be thoroughly spent because of her. So he wears her down is the idea there. He erodes all of his, or she erodes all of his resistance. Uh, he can't take it anymore. And that's very important to the flow of the argument then. If this little thing, then how much more this big thing? Uh, so he makes that decision. I'm going to give her justice. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Will not God give justice to his elect? The word there, elect, is eklektos, which means basically uh, God's uh, chosen ones. And how are they chosen? Are they chosen before, you know, uh, everything... Um, before the world came into being, does God choose winners and losers? No, the chosen ones are those who receive uh, God's grace through faith in Christ. Let's see, that's in verse 6. Um, uh, then the Lord said, Akus, Akusate, that means akuo, here. What the krites, the judge, uh, unrighteous, and the word that's used for it, again, is adikias. That's, ah is a, is a, a prefix meaning not, like ahistorical. That's not an historical fact, but someone says it's historical. No, that's ahistorical. Um, a, a theist is one who believes in God. An atheist, that A in the front, means they're not a believer in God. Well, this is an not righteous because the root word is um, dikaiosune, uh, uh, for someone who's righteous, this is an ah dikios, uh, 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 not righteous, unrighteous person. Hear what he says. Um, and then it says in verse 7, and uh, shall not God execute the avenging of the elect? In other words, uh, bring justice for the elect. Uh, the idea is he will render from um, justice 
uh, render a, a judgment from what is just for the elect. And there's that word, eklekton, which comes from the word eklektos, and it means uh, chosen out, elect, select. Um, it means those who are, it can mean those who are chosen from out of God's people for particular callings, but it basically has the idea that those those who are chosen by God are those who have received God through faith. Yes, that's another example of it, Ken. Uh, we, we, we've carried a lot of this stuff over from the Greek, uh, these kinds of, of, of terms that, um, um, you know, we, we, we're not even aware of. So this unrighteous, this not righteous judge renders this judgment. And Jesus how, says, how much more will God, who is just, give justice to his people? Uh, the, the people who are connected to him in Christ, who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? So again, we persist in prayer so that we, um, are, we are depending on God. When we are authentically uh, uh, calling out to God, we are depending on him. And Jesus says, that, G, that God will, den, will not delay in giving them justice, will not delay in making things right, even if that's um, making them right, right? Making them righteous. We have our agenda. God will take that and operate out of his agenda for our benefit. And then Jesus asks, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Some people think that this is uh, incongruous, that it doesn't belong here. I disagree. I think what Jesus is looking for is people who uh, are uh, persistent in their prayer because they persistently acknowledge their helpless need of God, and that's why they pray. Now, Real briefly, this parable raises questions about you know, where is God when systemic injustices happen? Where was God during the Holocaust? Well, the other answer scripture gives to all of that is that God is with the poor, the hungry, the persecuted, uh, the deprived. Um, and often you see greater faith in people who are not on the easy street than you see in people who are on it. And that will be the subject of the next parable, really. Nonetheless, our call is to love God and love neighbor so that when we see injustice as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we, like ancient Israel, who knew they had been delivered out of slavery in Egypt, we know we've been delivered out of the hands of sin and death. We're taken care of. And so our call is to speak up against injustice and to work against injustice, beginning with the proclamation of the gospel itself, but also standing up for and helping the poor the destitute, those who are treated with bigotry and injustice. That's our call. And we can do it in confidence because we know God has delivered us and given us justice we do not deserve, which is salvation. Okay, we'll end right there tonight and we'll look at the other parable, this unique parable, Lucan parable that is paired with the one we've looked at this evening involving the Pharisee and the tax collector. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for justifying us despite our guilt, delivered from sin and death and darkness by Jesus' death and resurrection, enfolded into your kingdom 
through repentance and faith, both gifts that come from you through the power of your word. We know we're completely dependent on you and cannot save ourselves, but you have saved us. We pray that we would we would love you and respect you and fear you and that we would have regard for our neighbor. Send us into the world with the good news of Jesus, unafraid of the judgment of the world against us because we know you judge your elect, those who have surrender to Jesus with your grace for all eternity. Please grant to each of us a good night's sleep, refreshed and ready to do your will tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks all. God bless you. Bye now. See you tomorrow at nine. Uh, that's what God wants. <laughs>